Hello, hi, hola, handle, and greeting. You know, I've recorded this a couple of times, and every time I make it too darn complicated. So I'm just going to begin very simply talking about layers for Infinite Painter, and it's going to be an HD canvas. We're going to take a look at the layers that are available and turn off the texture for this bottom layer, which is white. And the reason it's white is because every layer on top of the background is completely transparent with nothing on it. And that is exactly how Infinite Painter handles every layer, no matter how many you decide to add. A lot of us are familiar with layers because you could do something on a layer, and then if you're using a faux painting program that simulates paint, you could then paint on the same layer that has a different color and accidentally blend the colors together as though they're still wet. The advantage of using a brand new layer is that now you get to pretend your paint is completely bone dry. So new layers aren't exactly complicated, but what about what Infinite Painter lets us do with layers? When we export, we can export a PNG and preserve the transparency. And if we try to import that same layer as a reference, we'll see that with our fingers, we can scale it and rotate it. And with the stylus, we can move it to different parts of the screen. It has the shadow of the HD format that we used on the canvas to create that image. Well, here's a pin in the top right corner that handles that reference layer. We can hide it, we can reveal it, and we can delete it with a confirmation. If we were to bring it in, as a layer instead of a reference, we would be given the opportunity to transform that layer through rotation and scaling using that handy widget that occupies the same space as the content on that layer. So there's an expression that I want to talk about right now. Getting your layers to crop to content is actually really valuable and helpful when you're transforming a layer. And it helps to ensure that you don't have stray pieces of white somewhere else out here. It helps to ensure that the layer you're dealing with is exactly what it looks like. So, aside from rotating it and scaling it with these widgets from the center of the content on that layer, we can use the anchor option and change the center weight for rotation and for scaling on that same layer. The other two choices deal with warp, which actually will be a little bit harder to see right now. Long press with my finger, I get the eyedropper tool, I drop that orange, I go ahead and paint badly. I go ahead and paint badly again. I go ahead and paint a crosshairs, and we're going to select transform and warp. And now you'll see that center dot is actually a way to adjust the overall alignment. If you draw wiggly lines but wanted it straight, this could warp it back into being straight. If you draw a face that's looking straight at the camera, this can nudge it just a little bit to look over screen left or screen right. And then finally, of course, we have distort, which is fantastic. Think of it as a perspective tool. You could open it up on the right side and make it wide, close it down on the left side and make it narrow. And what I think is fascinating is that if you bring this handle on the right side through the left side, it will continue that distort cage as though it was headed off to a vanishing point over here. So there are more complicated things that we could do with layers. The reason I've recorded this so many times is because I've overcomplicated what should be very simple. So let's do an exercise where we just work with RGB and circle, triangle, square. So, a R circle. There we go. And I will fill that in. Good. And now a new layer with a green triangle. And I will do a blue square. <laughs> Who knew that was coming? Hey, by the way, you know what a mask is, right? It's where you select a layer and apply a mask. 
Have you noticed that there are no mask options here when you select a layer? I'm going to hide the top square, hide what is now the top triangle. How do you mask the red circle? Well, what if we clip it to the layer below that says Crop to Content? Crop to Content is now behaving as the alpha mask for the red circle. Here's proof. I can move the circle, which I cannot see, and I'll use the free transform. And once I put it over crop to content, it appears because it is clipped to the layer below it. Clipping is fantastic. Clipping can happen numerous times. Here's the green triangle, clipped to the layers below, but not to the red circle. It is also clipped to the letters. How do I know it's not clipped to the red circle? Because the green triangle doesn't appear where the red circle really is. Let's stop the clipping that takes place on the red circle layer by selecting Clip again. And now you can see what happens when the green triangle is clipped to the red circle. You can clip many, many times in Infinite Painter. It's as useful as your imagination for coming up with reasons to do it. If the opportunity is so great for clipping, why then do we have other choices like select and clone? And what is this lock all about? Now I'm going to unclip the red circle. I've hidden the two layers and unclipped the two layers above the red circle. And we're going to hide this bottom layer because the lock has to do with the alpha lock on the layer itself. Now, my recommendation is that before you do anything like that, you make a duplicate of the layer that you are about to mess with and hide the original, sort of like casting away a copy that is preserved. So you can do an alpha lock. And now, when you color blue, nothing happens. Unless you color blue inside what has the lock, and you are now locked into that which is visible on the layer that has activated the alpha lock. Remember in the very beginning we had two colors that smeared together? The alpha lock is destructive. You can smear colors together because you'll only be able to paint on that layer. Non-destructive layer clipping allows new colors in a paint program to affect the masked layer without disturbing what's there. Here's the great big example. I'm going to spend some time laying down a bunch of colors that are chaotic, much like my art career. All of these colors are an absolute jumbled mess, and they're not unified, as I joked, just like my art career. But there is something that could unify all of those colors into one singular shape that made sense. So I'm going to use dark blue. And the reason I'm using dark blue is to make a point. Here's a design that I think is pretty good looking. Hello, hi, hola, just like that. Now, if I reveal the layer with the chaotic paint and clip it to the layer I've just created, blue is what occurs in the space that was negative space on the chaotic layer. I've been messing around hunting for a new logo. And this might be the way in which I get that logo. You can set this off against a nice dark color or a nice bright color and really come up with something fresh. Another aspect of all of this is the masking. Personally, masking isn't something that fits into my workflow. But same as before, we recognize that everything crops to content. So no matter what the background and what the texture, we're only dealing with everything on that layer. When we choose to make a selection using that layer, the alpha of the layer becomes the anti-aliasing of the mask. So we have essentially created a selection mask, and we can do things to it with options. We can invert it, which means we can now draw around it. And that's like inverting the alpha lock. We could restore it back to its default and then choose to 
expand that selection mask, and Infinite Painter allows us to add 100% to the depth of that expansion, or crash. <laughs> Dear. Hey, look who's back. And now I will change my color to white, and I will choose the fill tool. When I learned about those little buzzing lines, they were called marching ants. So there you go. To me, like I said, this right here is not exactly something that's in my workflow, but maybe it's in yours. So I'm showing you. All layers crop to content. Now, since I just filled, all of this with white, that layer is now the entire canvas of HD. Finally, for what any of this is worth, I had been messing around a great deal with this guy as an example of something that I'd wanted to use these layer techniques to straighten out. I'm about to clean up this ink drawing because I want to color it digitally. And this is a whole other process, so let's do some snap edit magic, and the next time I start speaking, he will be all cleaned up of the highlighter and pencil marks, and just the marks of the black ink will remain. And there we are, crop to content. Some of what I'd enjoyed doing was distorting and warping, just to set this guy's face about the way that I'd envisioned. You can use the liquify tool and take care of the placement of things, if you do use this tool, remember to do it in small steps. There is no way to undo one mistake at a time. Once you have something that generally resembles what you're aiming for, commit. You may know to create a layer beneath that ink layer. You may also know to change that layer to a multiply blending mode. We can talk about blending modes another time, but there is a way to predict what blending mode will have what effect. Something I've enjoyed doing lately is laying down all these paint strokes beneath the boundaries of my ink drawing and letting some of the brush stroke and the canvas come through speaking for itself as texture. Once that's been done, I can easily create another new layer and then clip anything that happens to that layer, to the white paint layer I've just created. So now I can just keep going straight across with no worries as to whether or not I'm going to fall too far outside the lines that I drew. This has really let me get away with a lot of really interesting techniques to bring my ink into, as multimedia, the two-dimensional drawing world of digital paint. And while I tinker around and figure out what makes me happiest, you can explore layers on your own. I appreciate you watching the channel. I like your comments, subscriptions, your likes mean a great deal to me. I can be found here and there around the internet. You guys are great, and I appreciate all the virtual connections you make with me. I hope this has been of some use to some of you. I am moving on with some other artwork now. Thanks for the request, and thanks for watching.